good to be with all of you, and I look forward to sharing the knowledge, the experience, the work we have done this last year in the work on the therapeutic application of crystals. The whole scene started in September of 1969 when <clears throat> I sat one day in my office at IBM and I said, what more could I do for my corporation? I had and have to this day a very deep respect, love, and admiration for IBM, its objectives, and what it makes and promulgates to our fellow man. And the idea struck me. Could I give to IBM a course on creativity? Now, what brought me here with you was I wanted now to challenge the class, as I will try to challenge each one of you this week. And the challenge came when somebody gave me a article on Cleve Baxter. Do plants have emotions? Is there a shriek that a plant goes through when you pinch my leaf and it would scream? Here is the very first experiment I did. This is the experiment that turned my life around, and this is what brought this whole technology into being. That little squiggle that is called intent is what changed my life and has brought me into this whole crystal technology. Now, I could go on many levels of dialogue, but here is what I learned with the plant. One, that breath draws in a charge into our body of one polarity. The outgoing breath has the opposite polarity. So one is negative and one is positive. Negative and positive means there is two distinct different polarities in the indwelling and outgoing breath. Yes, the indwelling breath charges the oxygen into the bloodstream, forming oxyhemoglobin, but with that indwelling breath, we take in a power, a force, and that force is prana. The outgoing breath is releasing the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, hemoglobin, and it comes apart and releases in the outgoing going breath. But even more important, I find that the outgoing breath releases the patterns of thought. It releases the vibration that we accumulate within our body that we use for communication. Draw my breath in, hold, build the patterns of what I wish to say, and then release the breath in an outgoing form. Now, what I also learned was that when I draw the breath in, fill the lungs here, there's a four cycle characteristic to this, diaphragmic breathing, pulling the diaphragm up, putting pressure in the chest cavity, expanding the chest cavity, and then filling the pleura in this region. These muscles here were developed from breath and breathing control. When you do that, you press on the chest with the arms, and that squeezing of the lungs forces more oxygen into the bloodstream. Furthermore, it builds a charge density 
in you of an exceedingly high level. Now when you release the breath slowly, the energy flows in a cloud. But when you hold the breath in and release it in a sudden nostril burst, that charge remains consolidated and takes on a laser-like action. I practiced this hour after hour in front of a plant wired to a Wheatstone bridge, and I learned the exact intonation and pulsed breath that was necessary to move the charge. When you have this outward pulsed breath, the needle would just go off the chart from the charge that was released in the outgoing breath. When I just released it quietly, it was just a bare movement of the recorder. So I went back 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet, but with pulsed breath, you overcome the inverse square law requirement and you go into a new type of energy transformation. I went to the next quantum leap. I said, is there another substance I could work with besides a plant? There was one showed to me by Cleve Baxter that is conductive rubber. You can electrode a conductive rubber that is used by surgeons in their shoes, and you can communicate with that conductive rubber with your mind. You can get a change in electrical conductivity by just pulsing with your breath, and you can watch the change on that conductive rubber. At the time of that experimentation, I gave a talk at the Church of Religious Science in Los Angeles, and at the end of the lecture, a doctor of history came to me and said, I have quartz crystals which have the peculiarity of vibrating when you hold them in your hand. And I said, so what? But she said, I, I am impelled to send you one of these crystals. Finally, I said, fine, do it. I took the crystal that she had sent me, held it in my hand, drew my breath in, and happened to point the crystal at a friend of mine, Chuck McNosa, and as I pulsed the breath, the charge went through that crystal into this man, his head went back and he went into an altered state of consciousness. That was my first encounter with a crystal. I said, that is for the birds. I want nothing to do with it. Would you believe, a few days later, that crystal disappeared. I had it in my chiffonier, morning I got up, it was gone. I said, fine, it's gone, I needn't bother anymore. <laughs> that evening, Dr. McKistry called me, said, how are your experiments going? <laughs> I said, it's gone, I lost my crystal. He said, all right, I'll send you another one. <laughs> so I got the second crystal, that one lost. But finally she sent me a third crystal and said, fine, I'll work on it. And that's what started in 1974. And it's been a back-breaking journey of struggle. I worked with the natural crystals and found their limitation. They do not cohere the field that comes from the mind and body of a person. I said, if I'm going to work with a crystal, I must have a better form to it to get 
the type of field I want to work with and deal with to measure this field. So one morning I awoke and in my waking state I saw the tree of life. I saw this. I saw this shape. It appeared as, if you want to call it a dream or a vision, it stood in front of my mind's eye and it remained that way for minutes, not just a fraction of a second. No words, nothing, but just the image of this. I knew nothing about the Kabbalah and had no intimation or training on that. I then proceeded to cut and go to the laboratory where we had the glass shop and for one year it took me to cut and grind a crystal like this. Do you see the similarity? Ratio, proportions, and the life. What came out of this after 10, 11 years of careful study is a crystal cut to this shape and proportion <coughs> resonates, vibrates at the same rate as water. And I have the equipment here. It just was finished last Saturday where we can all sit down and measure this together. You can see the resonance of intrinsic vibration of this crystal resonating to the same value as water itself. The staff of life is water. And when you can cut and attune a crystal to the water molecule, you have then the primary channel of communication, of going into the bloodstream, which is essentially water, and injecting the vibration or pattern that the body needs for rebuilding, restructuring, and reforming what is required within it. The major discovery that we have made after a year's work in our laboratory now in San Jose is we can take this crystal, program it with our mind exactly the same as I've done now with the plant. Namely, I can charge it, get it oscillating, and then put a program into this crystal of what I want. It can be the love that is in your heart. It can be a Bach flower remedy, a homeopathic remedy, or other forms of medication. This vibration now in this crystal can be directly transferred to water. We have designed an apparatus to achieve and to do this.